Petersburg. Uh, welcome to uh, our second general lecture, but also the first in a special lecture series that we're having at this winter session. Uh, and um, I will introduce our speaker today, Andrew Nevins. Um, and Andrew will then tell you about that lecture series, which this is the first installment of and that Andrew is curating for us. I don't know if that's the right word. Do you curate a lecture series? You do now. Um, so he will tell you more about the details of that. All I want to do today is welcome everybody to the, the second general lecture and uh, encourage you to put your keep, you know, comment in the box, keep your cameras on because it's very nice for a speaker to see an audience, an actual audience. If you can do that, um, that would be great. Change your name like we always do in the little box, which I haven't done yet myself, so that we know who you are and where you are. Um, I'm doing that in real time without typos, did it. And um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Andrew Nevins, who is Professor of Language Sciences um, at University College London, UCL, um, in the Linguistics Department, which is part of the Division of Psychology and Language Sciences. And uh, Andrew is one of those linguists that's hard to introduce in a way because he really works on everything that has to do with language. He, you could say, I suppose, originally have said, well, he's sort of a phonologist. I mean, I suppose you could have tried to say that maybe 10 plus years ago, but, or even more than that, but you can't really do that. He is published in syntax. He's published in morphology. He's published in phonology. Um, he's thought about all sorts of connections among them. Um, he's done all sorts of uh, field work with people in uh, pretty much all over the world. Uh, and many of you know his work. Uh, some of you who don't are going to hear about some of it today. Um, I just wanted to say one other thing on a personal note, beside the fact that this actually marks 20 years since I met you, Andrew, at um, a different, a different uh, linguistics related school that we won't mention by name, so as to not, you know, uh, confuse people. But um, yeah, um, and uh, it is actually in part, and that was the summer of 2002 uh, in Novi Sad in Serbia. And it, in fact, um, discussions that Andrew and I had at that point about uh, that school and with some other people in, in part, in part led to the creation of this school um, and uh, modeled a bit on, on the egg school, which is, was an inspiration and still is. Um, and, uh, but in St. Petersburg. So there, there is a connection between Andrew and this entire project. So I just want to, to shout out to Andrew for, for always having been there all the way along um, this craziness. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing I wanna say is that the, the series that we're having today is which he will tell you about is related to a book, which he is publishing, it's coming out soon. That series got its start in a course uh, or that the concept of the book and the series got it started in a course, which was a course at this school. So you never know when a simple course that you're taking, simple in the sense of a new, a sh an idea of something that happens in two weeks can turn into something that has much greater consequences. And so I'm really happy about that and give it up for Andy Nevins. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Can you see my screen? Yeah, great. Okay. So this talk is titled Expanding the Canon, Minoritization in the World and in Linguistic Theory. And as John just mentioned, it is related to uh, the book, which is coming out sometime this year in 2022 with Cambridge, as you can see the flyer here on the left, When Minoritized Languages Change Linguistic Theory, which was a course taught at the NYI in 2018 in response to a um, question posed at the NYI in 2003, when students had asked me if it was true that generative grammar was developed and worked only for English. 
And this uh, book was a response to that particular question showing cases where minority lang minoritized languages have, I would say, definitively transformed linguistic theory forevermore so that the very trees we see represented by this mobile above me uh, need to be uh, re-envisioned in the light of uh, discoveries from a um, more inclusive sampling within linguistics. And as John mentioned, this is part of a four part series. Uh, the next lecture is this Friday, and then there's one Tuesday, and then there's one Wednesday. And those will be given, I think all of them at one o'clock. The one on Friday by Jonathan Bobolik of Harvard University. That is a um, comment specifically on one of the chapters of the book about ergativity and what we've learned about ergativity from minoritized languages. The one next Tuesday is by Maria Polinski of the University of Maryland. And that is what we can learn about the representation of gender and noun classes on the basis of minoritized languages. And the one next Wednesday is by Uju Anya of Carnegie Mellon University. And what she'll talk about are some of the challenges uh, relating in a university context to um, African-American students' participation and learning experiences in second language courses in learning non-English languages. And of course, how that relates more broadly to the issues of inclusion within linguistics that I'll get to at the very end. So thank you very much for participating and let's plunge right into this particular lecture. Um, and just to give you a sense, the particulars of the uh, book and of my focus that I try to tell in this notion of expanding the canon, uh, it really crosses the globe with these locations you see here that include um, really populations of minoritized languages and speakers uh, really all over the world that have been fundamental, I would say, to linguistic theory. And so they um, help us overcome this statement by Wolfgang Kuller, one of the founders of Gestalt psychology in the 1920s, who pointed out that narrowness in observation often protects narrowness in theory. And so the importance of having broader observations to really strengthen linguistic theory itself. And so the motivation that came from the 2003 New York Institute uh, experience that I had was the lament that generative grammar was invented only for English. Now, actually even early developments in generative grammar, Matthews 1965 on Hidatsa, Postal 1963 on Mohawk within generative grammar were based on indigenous North American languages. And in a book review of those two works, Ken Hale in a 1967 paper evaluated this as providing what he said, an indication of the extent to which a linguist working within the generative transformational framework can succeed in making interesting and significant statements about the grammatical structure of a language that is not his own. So actually really from the very start, it wasn't the case that generative grammar was developed and worked and applied only to English. But I still want to get away very much from this notion that, you know, perhaps when one works on minoritized languages, that they um, can be adapted or shoehorned into generative grammar and instead focus on this on specific cases where I would say, and I invite you to, I mean, I've already given an entire three week, not two week course at the New York Institute about the details, uh, and I'll provide an overview there, and I'd like to invite any of you who want to, to read them in more detail, but of cases where not only have minoritized languages sort of been adapted for generative grammar, but have changed the theory in irrevocable ways. But this sentiment still persists. So 1984, okay, not so recent, but also not so long ago, Foley and Van Balen say things like, in much and recent current theorizing has depended too heavily on English and familiar European languages with the result that this theorizing has been biased in favor of languages of essentially one grammatical type. And you know, it depends which textbook you take off the shelf. It may be the case that indeed the canon of textbooks on the shelf is largely biased in favor of languages of one grammatical type. But I don't think that that represents the field as it is today, nor the direction 
that it's going. So the aim of the particular book that I um, want to tell you about as part of this series is to just debunk this conception, to show that there are over a dozen well-entrenched moments in the recent history of the field where we've, have, we've had to reformulate our notion of what's a possible and indeed a representative linguistic structure based on findings from non-familiar and even what I call minoritized languages. Now, this uh, is a important trend within the social sciences more generally. And what you see in this particular graphic above is the well-known what's called Mueller liar illusion, where uh, if you take out a ruler and put it against your telephone or computer screen right now, you'll notice that the red lines in A and B are actually the same length, even though they don't look like it, right? Even though the eye is often tricked perceptually into thinking that the line in B is longer than the line in A. And this illusion is taken to be representative of the human visual system in many psychology textbooks and even in linguistics texts that often we'll talk about perception at the beginning. But what I would like to point out is that even with this example, we can learn something important. It turns out that this illusion, the Mueller liar illusion, doesn't actually hold for all humans. So let's talk about this. So if we assume, well, we've done experiments on the Mueller liar illusion with 20 undergraduates at a North American university. So it must be representative of all of humanity, past, present, and future. That's, that's, that's irresponsible, that's cavalier. The idea that I want to advance here is that we, if we want to make generalizations really about human nature, we shouldn't necessarily draw it from what actually turned out to be a fairly thin and actually unusual slice of humanity. And this is what a very intriguing paper by Henrich et al. call weird populations. What is weird? Well, they say that people like North American undergraduates uh, are weird. And what does weird mean? Well, weird is an acronym. Weird means Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and or democratic. And so what Henrich should all say is that that is not necessarily representative of all of humanity, past, present, and future, particularly uh, when one wants to think about, for example, the origins of many, many, many populations over thousands of years, that may not be representative of what the majority of humans have or will have lived, looked like and even been influenced, or you might even say corrupted by those systems that don't apply to everyone. So, the idea that many researchers have, and I'm sure that we've all been guilty of this to varying extents, is to say, well, I'll just take a convenient sample from the people that are in my classes or from the people that are around me, or I'll test with you know, students down the hall because those are happen to be who are down the hall, so it's easier to do so. But then think, well, those are the ones that will just generalize across all populations. And it turns out, for example, that in 1966, researchers led by Siegel found out that the Mueller liar visual illusion doesn't hold for, for example, the San foragers of the Kalahari Desert, nor for a variety of other populations around the world. And why that is, is actually another interesting question, right? You know, they discussed that it may be that, in fact, us with these <laughs> environments, these sort of uh, right angles and beveled corners in our in, in, in our homes, in our modern environments, these might lead us to create kind of optical calibrations and visual habits that perpetuate the illusion, but that this illusion may actually be, you know, the question is, who is more representative of human nature? People who live in these right angled environments who suffer the illusion or people who don't suffer the so you can't use the Mueller liar illusion to make broad claims about the human visual system, right? And that European populations are the default and others are a deviation. It may be that the contrary is true, right? It might be that the results that you observe with people in let's say Europe are unrepresentative about human nature, past, present and future. And I think we can see many ways in which this potentially 
applies to linguistics. I'll just mention to you, uh, Henrich et al's paper have two other very interesting examples about the what's called the fundamental attribution error in psychology where we impute values to people for reasons. So if someone you know cuts you off in traffic in the United States, you might say, well, that's because that guy is a jerk. That guy is just, that person is a jerk. Whereas they point out that in many other cultures, the immediate reaction will be, well, that person must be um, you know, driving to the hospital because a, a loved one is uh, in, in pain. And so it's having a sort of state level or individual level, immediate attribution is a different uh, baseline in many experiments. Another one that they point out is related to uh, prisoner's dilemma type cooperation experiments led by Martin Novak, where in many cases you need to build in a mathematical constant in order to see whether someone is trustworthy or not. But when the experiments were done with other populations in Bolivia, that mathematical construct, which actually complicated the theory, wasn't needed anymore. So again, we raised the question, if the theory had started with a different population rather than the one they started with, which would have been the baseline model? And I think it should be clear to all of you how those kinds of questions can be posed for language structures, right? Which kinds of language structures are the deviations and which ones are the baseline? So this leads to something that we might call epistemic vigilance, right? So, you know, Ostendahl, this is but one example, points out that inversion as a device for marking yes, no questions seems to be rather infrequent outside of Europe. Although that is the staple of you know, almost every introductory syntax class, but that does not seem to be one of the most representative ways of doing yes, no questions on earth. So we might think, why do we continue to use the same examples in theory that are not necessarily representative of all of humanity past, present and future? Now, I actually don't subscribe, by the way, to Heinrich et al's specific classification of what they call weird cultures and languages. If you look at the details of their, work, of their work, they say that they hold a typological cluster of properties. I think actually for linguistics, that's very tough, right? I think that there are so many distinct levels of linguistic structure that, you know, do we, when we talk about a weird language. Are we talking about their phonology? Are we talking about the syntax? Are we talking about the morphology? If we look at French's vowel system and Spanish's vowel system, they're so different, right? That I think nobody would group those together. So I think it's, you know, grouping together, I think the point we want to take away from Henrich et al. is not necessarily that there is a problematic or even an existence of a group of weird languages or cultures, but rather the methodological point the methodological importance of stepping outside of one's comfort zone in doing sampling and in doing linguistics and in doing research about what's representative. So, you know, they say that the, very often we, we rest on this assumption that if you derive a finding from one particular sample, well, then it's just gonna broadly generalize, so you might as well move on. So, you know, we can ask ourselves, would it have been the question that the syntactic theorizing in North America in the 1970s, if that had started with speakers of, for example, the Kamayura language of the Brazilian Amazon, which only embeds nominalized clauses, would the theory of complementizers started off differently than it has turned out today? Probably. Now you might say, well, that's fine. Okay, this will work. Eventually we'll work on every language. We start with Kamaira and get to English, or you know, we start with English and eventually get to Kaimaraya later. And you know, in the end, the theory will be the same when it's all said and done. Well, that's true if Kamaira is still around, then that is, right? And so that's one of the other issues that we cannot forget about. So we have to think about this notion of representativity and minoritized languages that might not always be there to quote unquote work on later. You said, well, those can be worked on. They might not always be there to work on there. Okay. And I think it's very important. And I use very much the notion, and I insist on the notion of using the verbal participle minoritized as opposed to the adjective minority, right? And in fact, the adjective minority is just inaccurate. 
for languages like Zulu or Hausa in South Africa, which have never been numerically minority, but they have been minoritized in terms of their status, in terms of their representation, in terms of their usage. So the term minority languages, if you use minority, that suggests some inherent quality of the languages, but that's not the case. The languages become minoritized by the result of actually active choices and actions that come from a whole range of agents, from political leaders to in fact members of the scientific community. And some of these intentions may be sinister and some of them may just be, as in the case of many of us, negligent. Um, you know, uh, my, uh, Nora England has excellent work on the Mayan languages that show that, you know, they, in fact, Mayan languages have an unparalleled number of speaker linguists and research in the Americas. But nonetheless, this is an uphill battle in a place where the languages are very often, and I'm sure you hear this all over the world, called what's in, 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 in Spanish or what's called their equivalent in, in other languages. They're called uh, dialects. And calling something dialects very often has a pejorative quality, even used by innocent, innocently to, 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 to degrade the um, status of the language. So what is a minoritized language? Well, it's typically one that is, in terms of linguistic usage, uh, used in a smaller number of domains than dominant languages. And very often, a minoritized language is not spoken monolingually. You get this one-way bilingualism where speakers of minoritized languages or signers of minoritized languages will learn a dominant language but not vice versa, and, uh, which results in very often <laughs> it's part of a much larger trend in the world of trying to have a single language as part of a national culture. So we see that, you know, in all of the major nations that one can think about, you know, from France to Russia, to China, to the United States, to Brazil, or you name it, we see the attempt to establish a single language as part of a national culture leads to this. Minoritized languages are languages that, you know, really just pure for purely social construct reasons, will have less power compared to other members or groups and societies dominant languages, official languages, written languages, languages of schooling, but also, crucially for our purposes, less overall representation in the scientific landscape and in the cultural landscape. As my son, about two years ago, when I was writing this book, said, well, a minoritized language, that must be, I said, what do you think that is? He said, that must be a language that you don't see many street signs written in. And that's exactly right. That's it. You know, a minoritized language is one that you don't see many street signs written. So this constant state of diglossia, this one-way bilingualism, means, for example, that if you're a signer of Black ASL, you have to learn two other dominant languages, White ASL and American English. And the reverse doesn't hold. And so, you know, very often, these languages are used only at home or in particular social situations. And crucially for our purposes, they aren't spoken in class at universities, which is where academics are doing their work, right? Minoritized languages tend not to be the kind of languages that we hear students speaking in the classroom or in the hallways or even are taught in, which is where we're doing our work. So in the universities, they're not being represented, they're not being used. So what are the case studies, for those of you who want to read more about this, what are the case studies that I treat in the book that I treated in the NYI a couple of years ago? What do they involve? Uh, I know that not this, this audience is not exclusively composed of linguists, but I want to go through this just to give you a flavor of what's included in, the, in, in chapter by chapter. In one of them, we see where Zazaki, this, I have a typo here, excuse me. where Zazaki and Uyghur forced the theory to change its semantics of indexicals in indirect speech reports. So 
Zazaki is massively minoritized in Turkey. Uyghur is massively minoritized in China. And uh, these languages have had transformative consequences on the theory of indexicals and indirect speech reports. You know, the, the, our theory of what an indirect speech report is, is never going to be the same as a result of confrontations between these languages and existing theory. In fact, you know, these languages presented what the philosopher David Kaplan had originally called monsters, thinking philosophically that languages of this type could not exist that if they were to exist, they would be philosophical monsters. And we found that these languages do exist. We as a field found that these languages do exist. And indeed, they've changed the theory forevermore. Basque and Chol have required that the theory change its assumptions about ergative case. Not being lexical, maybe like sometimes we think of particular oblique or inherent cases in certain languages, but being structural and that the ev evidence is so incontrovertible in these languages that it forces a complete rethinking of these kinds of alignment systems forever and about, about case more generally. The phenomenon of closest conjunct agreement in languages like Slovenian and Kosa has motivated the need for linear order as being an indispensable part of certain agreement phenomena in ways that really challenge the view of language as a mobile, as I have hanging from my ceiling here, uh, but you know, in in, 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 in restricted ways. Chichewa, spoken in Malawi, and Walbury, spoken in Australia, have transformed the theory of verbal structure so that what are called applied arguments, non-core arguments, but part of the event structure of a verb, have to be part of a larger and indeed configurational verb phrase. Nasality in the two Brazilian languages, Mashakali and Kaingang, have forced the rethinking of why mama and papa, as Jakobsen put it, uh, include the most natural of all consonants in a different way. Our whole theory of what it means to be the unmarked consonants is rethought as a, as a consequence of these languages instead of being unmarked contrasts within a system. Because these languages don't even have the three-way contrast. The use of symmetric hands in the phonology of black ASL, you know, uh, 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 black and white students as the result of uh, segregation and the Jim Crow laws were in separate schools for the deaf for up to 100 years. And in the white schools for the deaf, thanks to the, uh, not thanks to, but as a consequence of the policies of Alexander Graham Bell, where students were forced to do lip reading and in fact punished for signing and to sit on their hands for using their native language signing as a punishment, that educational so-called uh, innovation, which wasn't an innovation at all, was practiced only in the white schools for the deaf and not the black schools for the deaf. So that's a hundred years of divergence, of complete divergence between these two varieties of the language and careful studies of the differences have completely changed the way that allophonic two-handedness in sign language phonology has been studied because we have a very close comparison between two varieties of what was historically uh, the same language with different phonologies. And Hyaki spoken right now in the uh, Arizona, Sonoran, Arizona, and, 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 and Mexico, and Chechen, you know, which in the context of NYI, all you know about, these languages turn out to provide incontrovertible evidence that roots can supplete for number, so that the theory of morphology with suppletion must change, and that this type of root suppletion is distinct from when verbs can turn themselves into a mass event. So the same way you have count and mass in number, in, 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 in nouns that we know from a lot of work, uh, it turns out we have count and mass in verbal events. And we learned that as a very important way of conceptualizing the theory of number from these two languages. So then we might ask, that's great. In fact, now we have seen that linguistic theory has changed in all domains, phonology, morphology, syntax, and semantics as a result 
of this greater inclusivity, but what, what might we imagine uh, for healthier futures for the language sciences? What might a healthier future for the language sciences in years to come consist of? Well, obviously, continue to work with minoritized languages. I think that is, turns out to be fundamental, but perhaps a rethinking now of the ways that it's done. In that, indeed, even natural language processing research, which I think all of you must have on your minds and all of you must use to a certain extent in a daily basis, has very often treated English as a default proxy for all languages. But this is done in ways that continue to perpetuate inequalities about the types of resources available for NLP. Here in London, for example, uh, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine said that they immediately needed, you know, a automatic translation uh, tool with Google or Bing or wherever it was available for um, the uh, for Afghan refugees who had come to London speaking uh, Dari and Pashto. And those resources weren't available and not even extensible, maybe not available, but even extensible in a clear way with NLP research. So what Bender points out, Emily Bender, is that NLP research often talks about language without even mentioning English. They just say natural language and they don't even say that English, they don't even mention the name of the language is English. Under, in long term, that undermines the own goals of NLP. So, okay, we know it's a fact that there aren't enough Kurdish or Mashakali or Black ASL or Hiyai speaking or signing linguists. And, you know, we can and should ask ourselves what can be done to change this. Well, we can ask how would linguistics have to change in order for more people from various minoritized groups, racial want to study, teach, or learn linguistics? What is it about the way that linguistics is currently being practiced that maybe drives away, has not included, has not encouraged a greater number of potentially minoritized people, linguists, to want to participate in linguistics? The historical reasons for why I think are, 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 are clear and, and can be enumerated and are enumerated in many places, but the question of how how would linguistics have to change is one that's only been very recently posed uh, with great fervor within linguistics. And particularly this article that I highly recommend by Hudley, Mallinson and Buchholz, 2020, both A and B, you'll see, uh, is one step in that direction. Uh, and so I'm gonna outline here sort of two separate strands or directions, one, is where minoritized languages might require changes in linguists' daily work. And another is where uh, linguistics itself, where specifically academic environments and funding agencies might change and refocus to become more inclusive of minoritized linguists in a way, for example, Michelle DeGraff in one, in one of the papers in this collection points out, to serve the needs of the, of the colonized communities whose languages form the foundation of linguistic scholarship in many linguists' careers. So given that that's the case, how can things be rethought and refocused? So the first strand is what I would um, call here and following a term is coined by Eva Tchaikovska Higgins, community-based language research. And she recognizes the importance of work that's done where the linguist has a different kind of job. The linguist is actually a consultant, an external consultant. And the agenda for what the linguist is going to do is not defined by what funding agencies prioritize or by what is considered prestigious in linguistics journals or by what is considered important for promotion, but, but what, what that community might consider their agenda, their priorities. And so Gertz 1990, uh, I see this is an excellent article that points out specific ways that linguists can serve communities. Um, and here are some of them. One of them 
is in training uh, teachers of the language, right? I mean, it's important for every language, be it English, be it Russian, be it French, that there be language teachers for that language. So if you're working with a minoritized language, how can you help train teachers of those languages? How can you help people who are teachers of those languages in becoming better teachers? We know that a lot of people do linguistics, get interested in linguistics because of language teaching. But a lot of language teachers of minoritized languages may not be yet or may not ever be involved directly in universities. So linguists can easily help in training teachers and helping teach the language. Linguists can be external consultants that help as mediators between speakers of languages in universities. Linguists can advocate for native language programs at universities. Linguists can, and these are many very compelling cases of this, serve as expert witnesses on matters that involve language, like place names for land claims. This is a very important, the stakes are very high here, and linguists can help by showing that place names and other historical records show that a particular piece of land historically has always been part of a particular community. Uh, Ethnobiological uh, studies and translation for museum exhibits. How many of you have been? I've been to the Ethnological Museum in St. Petersburg. <laughs> the exhibits are not very good. How many of you, I mean, it's okay, but you know, how many of you could find cases where you as a linguist might work to make sure that subtitles, the translations in documentaries and museum exhibits in non-specialist knowledge about a particular community is accurate. And actually I know many linguists who for these reasons find this kind of work to be so fulfilling that they might lead to meaningful careers outside of academia proper. You know, a lot of people that I know that have worked with minoritized languages decide to leave academia and do something else and find it more meaningful, specifically because that allows them to work with specific uh, agendas and priorities that are not defined by the prestige and funding that the university and, and very, what I would say, narrow strictures uh, uh, prioritize. There is a lot of work on what's called decolonizing fieldwork. And although that sounds like a heady term, it's very straightforward and clear to apply some of these things. Field methods courses. I mean, every speaker of every language, particularly minoritized language, will have a very specific way of thinking about what language means to them. And very often will have a different kind of research methodology for approaching any kind of research. If you look in fields like geography, anthropology, sociology, all of those fields are already thinking about how to engage crucially with these different epistemologies. Linguistics is very behind in this. A lot of indigenous collaborators have trauma in working on their languages for good historical reasons. And right now where there's tons of language archives online, linguists say, oh, I'm gonna make an archive of, of, of all of the data I correct from these languages for my grant application. But is that put online in a way that speakers themselves can access in a meaningful way? Is the way that, you know, endangered language archives are put online at all appealing or meaningful for speakers of those languages to access? And how can that be changed? It's a fact that Native Americans are the least represented within the discipline in the United States. And that is in stark contrast to the extreme presence of Native American languages in linguistic scholarship. And what Kohti Kuhil says, I believe that this is a very uh, uh, chilling quote almost, says, it is difficult in Guatemala for linguists to define themselves as, well, I'm just doing science. I'm just, I'm just neutral or apolitical. I'm just doing my science. Because the languages that they work on are sentenced to death and officially demoted. The linguist who works on Mayan languages has the option of activism in favor of a new linguistic order in which equality and the rights of all the languages is made concrete. We as academics have voices that universities, the governments, the policymakers will listen to. We need to use it. The second thread is about inclusion and equity in academia. Now, the Linguistic Society of America has recently published a statement 
on race and the recent issue of language, uh, but I mean, the Linguist Society of America is in a way very behind other fields in doing so. But we're making, making steps are being made in the recent issue of language on racial justice in linguistics. But you know, there is this perception that because Chomsky and Boaz and, and the field is very uh, universalizing and colorblind, that you know, linguistics is not a field where this is a problem. But the quantitative statistics represent, they point to very stark problems of representativity in higher academia. There are no linguistics programs at the moment in historically black colleges and universities. There are shortcomings in, in, in diversifying the profession. And this leads to academic limitations for the field, okay, as well as what Rickford calls socio-political embarrassment and indeed and I think, and this is again a very important insight from Hudley Mallinson and Bill Colts, that the disciplinary failure within all of linguistics to our failure to recognize that there is racism within linguistics comes from the idea that, well, okay, well, racism is an individual and intentional act. But no, you know, it's often a structural factor that's below the awareness of those who enact it, the way that we ourselves may talk about what constitutes prestige, reward, important research. These are more below the radar acts that drive a lot of people away from doing linguistics. And in fact, you know, by keeping linguistics as it is, fairly narrow and exclusive field, we end up limiting the amount of resources that are allocated to the discipline. But the whole discipline will benefit from a larger tent. So what is driving away many linguists of color? Uh, there are a range of factors. Okay? One of them are curricula that may be alienated. So there's a difference between in a class explicitly mentioning the absence of research by scholars of color instead of just you know, passing over this exclusion in silence. There are still very narrow definitions of prestige in academia, of reward in academia, and what constitutes an investment in admissions and in hiring and promotion, right? And so there's this policing of what counts as you know, real linguistics when you know, community-based work, when work that serves communities, when work that looks at you know, range of issues much broader than uh, what constitutes you know, publication in particular journals, how can we empower racially minoritized groups and linguists rather than isolating uh, further? And you know, how can we overcome this question of what are the outlets for community-oriented scholarship being perceived as prestigious? So I think that there are a lot of challenges ahead to maintain a healthy future for linguistics so that we can continue to see many other future chapters of uh, mutually beneficial relationships between language sciences and minoritized languages. And I think with that, I'll turn things over with ample time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot, of, um, a lot of comments and questions. So why don't we just, after we, everyone's finished with their little clappy hands, um, can just put up your um, artificial hand or your real hand, your uh, Simpsons open hand. question, or, <laughs> or, or someone else's hand, and then you can put up, put a question in the box if you'd like, but we prefer them to be live. And um, I think maybe you can unshare your screen so that we can have a nice picture of everybody. That's a um, good idea. And we've got two, you want to take your own questions There's already a couple in the box. You see them, I'm sure, right? Um, that should pop up on your front of your screen too. I can call on them if you want. Yeah, uh, that would be helpful. That, okay, let me do that. Um, so mind. let's see. Yeah. Uh, so Niaz, you're first. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you for your nice lecture. I just wanted to say whatever you said reminded me of my own language. Uh, my language is Kurdish and I live in Iran. But unfortunately, Kurdish is a minoritized language. Uh, 
although it is really rich, but it is not taught at schools or uh, students, even university students are not even allowed to speak their mother language at universities or to defend their MA thesis in their mother language. But this is so sad because I've seen um, many students here, especially university students who cannot speak Persian very well. I mean, the Kurdish ones, because well, normally it's not their mother language, but it's so sad because they're not allowed to even defend their thesis in Kurdish. So uh, I totally understand what you say. And as, a, as an MA student, I wish to work more on my mother language so that I can do something about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, that's, that's, that's wonderful to hear, hear from you. And, and, and that's a very good example, you know, that students aren't allowed to even present or write or defend their MA in their native language. I mean, there's no, there's, there's no reason for that. There's no reason for that. And that's a, a huge uh, bar and obstacle to scholarship. You know, I have this movie on, um, I think you can find it on YouTube called With an Eye and an Ear Towards Zazaki, where I interviewed a bunch of, well, random students walking across the street in front of MIT about whether they knew that Kurdish was an Indo-European language. And, you know, that's, they, didn't, they didn't even know that Kurdish is an Indo-European language. So, you know, the level of awareness is, 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 is very low. And I think, as you point out, it's very clear that we find minoritization even within academic departments in not allowing that to be a language of scholarship. So thank you very much for your contribution. And I, I indeed hope that you and many of your colleagues will, will work on that. Yeah, thank you for that. And please feel free to be in touch with me uh, at any time, you know, outside of the confines and restrictions that we have imposed on us in, in, in a very busy and active program within this lecture. Thank you. Um, next is Sasha. Yeah, thank you so much for the lecture. I was, it was very, very interesting for me. Uh, I have a question, but before I ask it, I want to clarify that I'm a Russian native speaker and Russian is not minoritized. So probably I don't understand feelings of people who uh, whose language is minoritized, but I wanted to ask, uh, isn't it a evolution process of uh, languages dying, like the species are dying? And is it really uh, worth the effort to save them? Like we, we don't want to save uh, species that are not uh, able to live in the circumstances. Yeah, this is my question. Um, I guess I would beg to differ on at least a couple of the assumptions that you have there. So, I mean, I would beg to differ about the importance of uh, biodiversity in the biological domain and its importance for uh, not only speciesism, I think that it's not really up to humans to decide uh, what species uh, deserve to survive on the rest of the planet. I would also probably disagree that even for the sake of humans, that it's healthy for um, biodiversity to just go by the wayside. And I think that there's a lot of science that supports it. And I would not- it, by Isn't any, it, uh, like when we save the languages, isn't it exactly when human decide who should live and who should die uh, in like talking of languages? Yeah, I, I, I don't think at any point today um, I mentioned the notion of saving languages. I don't think I actually mentioned that. So maybe, you're, you know, you, but yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for your contribution. I just have to say that we probably differ on too many assumptions in order to have too much of a, of a, of a productive uh, discussion about it at the moment. I'd like to give uh, room for a couple of others because I don't really share your belief or your uh, contention that um, language uh, endangerment and minoritization is quote unquote a natural process. I think it's actually one that's artificial and it's imposed for a lot of uh, social and political reasons that are extremely unfair and that are um, not related 
to the inherent scientific uh, importance of the languages themselves, which is what my emphasis has been on. Thank you. Uh, Fred in Brazil. Hello, Dr. Nevins. Thank you so much for the excellent talk. Uh, the question I have, which is not meant to be an inflammatory question, but it's more like an epistemological question, uh, which is that like generative linguistics, one of its like trademarks is it's it's a very formal system, right? It's a very organized, uh, formalized system to understand your language. And for that reason, it is easily importable into other languages and other countries, right? Uh, however, my question is how flexible must uh, as a broad theory generativism be in order for like say other countries to create their own generative linguistics. By that I don't mean like to reformal a generativism it's like basic precepts. What I mean is how much like formal gatekeeping um, must exist and how much must it not in order to linguistics to become truly diverse. Uh, because if you look at generative linguistics and compare it to other social sciences or the humanities, it is in a, a bit of a weird spot in the sense that most of what like, has been proposed as the precept of generativism has been proposed by a single group of people in a single country, right? Which is the United States. And then this science is exported into other countries and they're expected to do more or less precisely the same kind of science and speak it, like to write in the same manner uh, and so on. So the question is like, how do we make our field more flexible uh, to accommodate more and more diverse uh, populations? Yeah, thank sorry you. that was confusing. No, it was not confusing at all. I think it resonates very much with the points that I tried to make, the two points at the end, I think about, about the healthier future for the language. And I think like many important questions, um, there are challenging answers, not necessarily completely straightforward, but I think that you know one of the things that you mentioned, a key term that I think, I think we found a point of resonance in what I said as well, is about this notion of formal gatekeeping, yeah, and about the notion of finding ways for prestige and reward and publication to be more. We have similar concerns, and I would love to continue to exchange ideas with you about solutions to those. I think you've done a very good job in identifying some of the issues. Uh, thank you, Natasha. Hi, thank you. That was a very interesting talk. So I had a question about one of the slides that you mentioned about how there are all these minoritized languages that have forced us to reconsider our existing yeah. linguistic theories. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering about there are also plenty of minoritized languages that don't do that, right? And in, in many ways, that makes them uninteresting for us in the sense that we don't look at those languages anymore because, so it, in the sense that we, we don't, you feel like we start looking at minoritized languages only if they're interesting in that sense, where they challenge, if there's something exotic that our current theories don't consider, and then we sort of tend to ignore the other languages that fall very neatly within these theories and then how would we go about studying such languages? Yeah, I, I think that's a very important point. I mean, indeed, when I was at the New York Institute a couple of years ago, I had uh, one final section in the last course, which was called When Minoritized Languages Don't Change Linguistic Theory. And I talked there, very personal uh, case about, you know, the, the, the Piraha language, which I think is a a minoritized language, very minoritized in the context of the Brazilian Amazon, but the data from which have not changed linguistic theory because there needs to be a engagement with existing pieces of the theory, right? You don't change a theory by nihilism, right? You change a theory by engaging with specific postulates and showing how those need to be replaced by other postulates. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, it still requires a dialogue between theory and the languages and the way for that isn't always given, right? Sometimes those two things approach each other in uh, different ways. And the languages, in fact, that you know ended up changing linguistic theory here, in a way, just like going back to the question we just had from biology, sometimes came from unexpected places, right? You never know which organism who knew that pea pods 
would change biology, right? If that was an accident for Mendel. Apparently, a lot of other species didn't. So there's not really a way to know in advance what's going to happen. And I think that that means we need to be as inclusive as possible and see where the science goes. Thank you. Um, Ed is next. I'm just taking them in the order that I see them. I don't know if it's the order they showed up, but it's the order I see them. There is a reason to it. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor, for that wonderful talk. Uh, I can't wait to read a bit of that book that's about to come out this year. It's going to be doubtless really interesting. Um, my question actually ties into the la the previous question about how um, how exactly um, uh, typology, which is I would assume is like the study of like a large amount of languages, including minoritized languages, to what extent that informs theory? Because um, I remember reading a paper by Frederick Neumeier, who said that. Um, a bit more um, uh, 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 alarmistly that um, uh, typology is irrelevant for grammatical theory because it aims to explain a, um, a possible language, not a probable language. So um, I what I assume by this is that um, he's not really so concerned with the surface about how languages present, I guess, at these interfaces. Um, and I know through a lot of generativist literature, there are a lot of like um, generativist interpretations of how um, every single language has a hierarchical structure. Um, there's uh, papers about this in Nawak, Meskwaki, and uh, Greek. Um, and so I was wondering what you thought of uh, Frederick Neumeier's um, stance on typology informing grammatical theory. That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question. Um, if you, you know, I cannot do everything within the scope of uh, my own work and with the scope of this book, and I hope that many others will, 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 will that's one of the reasons I'm giving this lecture, will see the resonance and can, can find complementary ways to contribute to the discussion. So in my own work, I haven't really looked too much at cases coming from typology because I've really tried to focus on ones that specifically came from my own, my own background. Like my own background is as a formal generative linguist, and I became very interested in this question of cases where even within generative linguistics itself, we can change the canon, we can change the textbooks, we can change the content of the courses. And so I actually probably don't have so much to say, but I hope that many others would about what goes on in typological approaches to language. I think that if obviously it's a very, in a way, parallel pursuit, but yeah, I would say that perhaps, you know, in, one has to draw a certain methodological uh, boundaries in, in what one uh, looks at. And my focus has really been within generative linguistics. What are ways that it's generative linguistics has benefited and continue to benefit from minoritized languages? Now, the, 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 the parallels there and the question of possible versus probable languages. Yeah, it's extremely interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. I hadn't thought about that distinction in a long time. And you've given me something, you've given me some food for thought there. Thank you. Uh, Yola and then Alexandra. <clears throat> See, I'm writing stuff down here, people. Yeah, I, I can't hear you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Forgot to unmute. Um, I'll read what I wrote, um, and it seems several others were interested in this question too. Um, could you say more about community based language resources? And do you have any positive examples of resources which are valuable to speakers of minoritized languages? And I was also thinking are you uh, um, referring to? Um, you know, or the accessibility of academic materials? Like, is it is it about the question of what resides in academia or outside of academia? Or um, could you say more about the field of community-based research? You know, this is kind of a, a bigger question, but specifically, are there examples that you that are really positive in in this this type of practice? Yeah. So I'm I'm I apologize. I know we don't have that much time altogether. So this slide may have gone somewhat quickly, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's the, what you say is exactly what my, um, my emphasis and ideas were, ways that have been outlined in these particular two cases. I've given examples from researchers within Canada, but I know and have worked with others in, in, in Brazil and South Africa who have specifically, as I said, decided to make language archives, documentary materials accessible to and usable to and meaningful for 
the speakers of the language, have worked with land rights, have worked with teacher training, have worked with advocacy in universities. And so those are some of the positive examples uh, that have worked in the past and I think that can continue to be extended. Uh, I, follow, I, I, I try to cover that here, but I also try to cover a lot. I apologize for that one quickly, but I think what, they, what you're mentioning is exactly in the same spirit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alexandra and then Vinny, I'll always mention the one on deck so they don't feel uh, that they aren't noticed. Alexandra. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor, for your like uh, inspiring and inspired, I think, lecture. That was just wonderful. And um, I've got a question as I am uh, now learning uh, Goidelic languages. Um, you know, like uh, uh, the, the Gaelic languages are Irish, uh, Scottish Gaelic, and Manx. And um, my question is about Irish itself. So, uh, as we know, Irish is uh, more or less an official language of uh, Ireland, uh, of, uh, of Ireland. And um, the point is, uh, my, my question is, is it fair to call Irish, in fact, an a minoritized language in its own country, because as we understand, uh, Irish like people are not really into learning their own language, and they're trying to learn English more and more and leave their country for like better opportunities and stuff. And hence, Irish is less popular, is less is meaningless in some way. And is it fair to call it minoritized? I would say yes, I would say yes. And so you might say, well, in today's context, right, it's, there's, a, well, there's Northern Ireland, um, that was the Irish Republic, and, you know, well, in today's context, you know, this is a country that it has, you know, its own sovereignty, but no, I mean, historically, definitely minoritized. Historically, definitely. And in fact, Duolingo, Duolingo, I think, suggests that there are more people studying Irish outside of Ireland than there are inside of all of Ireland. So, you know, there is something about this uh, uh, devalorization of the language uh, within its own borders for reasons that at the moment, you know, you could say are related to identity and economics, but historically have come from a long, long line of minoritization. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, it was an interesting example to discuss. Um, Vinny, I lied, I'm gonna inject something else before we get to you which we will still get to have plenty of time to go, keep go over a bit more. Um, there's a question in the um, person would ask me to read out loud from Daria. I, I'm um, sorry, I haven't been looking at the chat. No, it's okay, absolutely. I've been following it and this is the sort of the only question that I think is a full question that um, I would read out loud, which is Daria says, I come from the Oriental Department in St. Petersburg State University, I think there are students who would be interested in linguistic research in rare or minoritized languages, but there are almost no resources or no, for almost no or no resources at all to do so. They won't be given grants. There are probably no professors for this language. So if there aren't any bright individuals in the field who work just for the sheer data, which isn't all the time possible for obvious reasons, we're not in a good place. It's, so it's a comment more than a question. But and it's, that's wonderful. You know, and I, I say to everybody, including when I, you know, try to help uh, John Balin recruit people to teach at the New York Summer School, why it's such a wonderful summer school because of the students. What makes this a good summer school is, is, is because of the students. And I love having you all as students and participants from all over the world to share your own experiences and context with me. So that's yet another example, which I was not aware of, but, with, but which fits the same pattern, you know, very well that work on minoritized languages at St. Petersburg State, as you reported, is not rewarded, is not incentivized, is not considered prestigious, despite the obvious scientific value and contributions of doing so. And so that's yet another example uh, of, of things that I think lead to this kind of linguistic activism. Vinny. So I think Deistra might have actually had her hand up before me, unless it is just no, still. That's a, that's please. okay, Vinny. You can go ahead. I can go after you. That's fine. You sure? I don't mind. No, no, oh, okay. no. That's fine. Cool. Okay. So you briefly mentioned um, NLP, and I, I um, have huge problems with a lot of like the approaches and goals taken with NLP currently, and I think a lot of it has to do with like. 
uh, you, you know, performance being predicated on seeing like enormous amounts of data. And I feel like that makes it so that it's almost like parallel to the, you know, building a good theory, like getting a good, like chasing the best score for your model. It, you just naturally look at the thing that has the most data. And so I, that's like a particular area of interest in mine is how to combat that using like theoretical computational linguistics, I guess. But cool. what sorts of things have you seen or do, like, do you imagine for making that goal more tangible for like one, producing better results and two, making it more accessible to people? Because that's a point that you made that I really haven't thought about in that domain. And I think really hasn't been thought about much, <laughs> at least that I've seen, but yeah. Yeah, no, the one, the one I mean, I have looked at it um, a bit and, and the, the one voice that I have found the most that I have mentioned in the talk and I, I think pretty easy to find later is by Emily Bender. Um, but I think that there's a great deal more that can and should be said about this, you know, and I've, I've been to the offices of Google down the street here in London and talk to them about how they choose the languages that they want their work to be done on. And, um, you know, I didn't really get a straight answer, but uh, I think that, you know, you, you identify uh, for the long-term goals of the field and even for the short-term uh, notions of, of equity of what is represented. I mean, if NLP is at all related to kind of artificial intelligence and to cognitive science and to models of the mind, there are so many different language types out there. And again, going back to the Mueller liar illusion, English is weird. It's not maybe the, even the most representative of human languages. So thanks for sharing that concern. I'm glad that resonated with someone. And you know, this if this summer school were in person, we could be, you know, having tea in the samovars and talking about this for hours in the courtyard. Um, but for now, I really do want to invite all of you to you know, keep in touch with me and, you know, I'd love to have a, a Zoom or a Skype chat with you at some point afterwards. I do also want to mention the relevance of the next three lectures in this series to other uh, related spokes or facets of this same topic. So please stay tuned for those. Uh, Dishra, did you have a question? I never, I didn't actually see your hand. <clears throat> yes, um, I had, um, it wasn't really a question as such that I just wanted to, um, uh, to mention a, a slight clarification, well, addition uh, point um, to the presentation, Megan, thank you for the talk, actually. Um, <clears throat> uh, my point was in regards to the Native Americans that you mentioned. So they're not the only at uh, least uh, marginalized in regards to linguistics because there are other disciplines and other fields such as psychology and um, medical sciences as well where they are um, also not just Native Americans but Aborigines as well in Australia where they are also the least likely looked at um, in regards to side effects and various other issues. Um, that's one part. The other part I just wanted to clarify regarding the um, the comment on the Irish um, or Irish being marginalised. So as someone who had quite a lot of Irish students in Aberdeen um, when I was studying there as well, Scottish students from the islands, um, this is actually a slightly misconcepted view that they don't want to learn Irish Gaelic or Scots Gaelic and um, there are also their own dialects it's not actually true that they also haven't from all these decades in a sense still learnt them in their schools um, for example in Aberdeen Doric is taught in primary schools and preschools and um, the, stu the children use it quite um, heavily on the communities and we can see the emergence of that at the moment with being in um, quite recently, I believe Professor Nevin, Nevin might have heard of that, of the, um, of the Scottish Parliament looking more into that on integrating Scots further at the moment. But that is also the same that is currently 
um, being happening in Northern Ireland. So I think that is where the confusion is. However, in Ireland itself, that is not in a sense being marginalized. It is actually still part of the education system. It's just they're kind of viewed as being equal rather than one being dominant over the other. Great. Well, thank you uh, very much for your clarification on that second point. Um, I think that that's a useful point of, of dialogue between you and uh, Alexandra Dalize. And on the first point, I would say, actually, you're right. In, in, in fact, it's very acute in other fields, medical fields, education, community-based work, psychology, very acute. But what's different is that actually those other fields have for many years now at least been addressing and thinking about this. Whereas in linguistics, it's, it's extremely recent and still very few voices. And so uh, really what I wanted to draw attention to is specifically within linguistics, um, uh, uh, the need for linguists to have more dialogues of this sort. Thank you. And I appreciate that and I agree. I think they actually um, should. I just hope they learn from the mistakes of the other fields as well. <laughs> right. Thank you. Right, right. If there aren't any hands right now, I just wanted to, I can't, I would like to just inject a, a sort of semi question to Andrew that many, many people in this audience know about the Pierre Aha controversy. Um, but, but, and this, I mean, this, you know, the, the claim that an extremely, uh, you could say minoritized language change linguistic theory was made, um, that, that some basic claims of generative grammar were wrong. Uh, and it took looking at this language um, to debunk them. Um, we know that this is a false claim and Andrew has written on this topic, but I wonder if you could just update us on the status of that controversy and, and, and where you think um, that fits into this bigger picture. And sorry to do it, but- Well, I mean, yeah, I, for the students. yeah I, I won't actually probably spend too much time on it because I was told we only had one hour and I've actually scheduled a meeting with my sign language dictionary collaborators for, for right now. But, you know, if you look at this particular slide here, um, you know, in, I could have said, you know, on the first bullet, you know, Zazaki showed that David Kaplan is wrong. You know, Basque and Scholl showed that Marantz is wrong. Closest conjunct agreement showed that Chomsky is wrong. Nasality and Mashkali showed that Jakobsen is wrong. You know, Hyaki showed... And that again, that you know, Morans and, and some details of Chechen that Kyrgyz is wrong, but it, it's not that. It's that specific theoretical postulates in specific aspects of the of their theories were wrong or needed to be changed, but not that the person is forever wrong. It's that specific aspects of the theory that can be changed and modified were. I'd say in the case of Piraha, there wasn't any. Uh, attempt of that sort. It wasn't that a specific aspect of the theory needed to be changed and modified. It was that the whole theory is wrong. Recursion, and, recursion. Well, but that wasn't really a specific, I don't, there wasn't really any specific place where besides one sentence in Chomsky, Hauser and Fitch, which is not really a theoretical paper, where it was claimed that, you know, all languages must have finite uh, embedded clauses. So I didn't, I don't, I don't really see that. Well, I hate to add, I'd like to end with a bang rather than a whimper, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I would encourage you all to um, keep thinking about this, to keep in touch with me and to see that, and I feel very enthused. I mean, the whole point of giving a lecture for me anywhere, anytime is the, is the quality of questions and interaction that I get. I was very happy to hear the voices of so many of you today that I've written down about how this resonated with, with your concerns and how this is going to actually be uh, improved in various ways for other audiences in the future. Uh, so thank you very much. And please, I'll see you in the other lectures within the series. Let's, in any format you'd like, let's thank Andrew so much for starting off this wonderful series. It's going to continue um, throughout these two weeks. Uh, but thank you, Andrew. Don't be late for your next meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Okay. Paka.